Hello everybody, happy Halloween and welcome back to my channel. So before we launch in today's video, which is a crazy one, guys, it's a crazy one. I'm actually surprised I haven't heard about it more often. But before we launch into that video, let's have a word from our sponsor, the lovely, talented, and beautiful Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a new kind of documentary streaming service. They offer tons of documentaries and they are adding more every single week. There's over 2,000 documentaries on there right now and every time I go into Magellan TV to watch something in my queue, I find another documentary that I want to watch later and I have to add that to the list. So I'm definitely excited to share it with you. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that I'm a huge fan of Magellan TV. I'm a huge fan of documentaries in general and I don't want to hear any more comments trying to correct the way I say documentary. It's just the way I speak. I think most people in this neck of the woods say documentary that way and even if they don't, I don't care because I'm too old to change. I think the content that you get with Magellan TV is more than worth the amount you end up paying for. And you can get Magellan TV by the month or by the quarter or by the year. I personally just did the year thing. That way I can pay and I don't have to think about it. And from now on, I just have all of this great content at my fingertips on my tablet or on my Roku or on my TV or on my phone. And I don't have to worry about it renewing or anything like that because it's so so worth it. So you guys should definitely check out Magellan TV if you haven't already. The link is always in the description box. And if you use the link in the description box, you can start your first month's free trial with Magellan TV. If you don't like it, you can cancel at any time, but I don't think that you're going to want to. I have a couple recommendations for those of you who have already signed up for Magellan TV. So I know they're really not related to the video that I'm talking about today, but they are kind of like creepy, cool things for October and November. First, we have this documentary called War on Witches, and it says, the film goes back to the late 16th century with Europe in the grip of a brutal witch hunt fever. Thousands were tortured and burned at the stake in France and Germany. So, so good. Okay, and now the other one is called The Neanderthal and Us, and it's basically a group of modern investigators who show you how close the modern human is to the Neanderthals. So I watched both of those. They were so good. I learned a lot and that's really what this service is for. It's for people who want to be entertained and to learn a lot at the same time. So go ahead and check the link in the description box. Thank you so much as always Magellan TV for sponsoring this channel. We love you and let's get started on the video. So this is a Jane Doe case and Jane and John Doe cases have always interested me but they've also frustrated me because in a lot of them there's no real closure. We find these people, they've been you know brutally murdered at times and we just just don't ever figure out who they are, which makes it very sad. Even more sad, I think, than any other cases because these people don't have anybody there to remember their name. A lot of the times we just never figure out who these people are and they're buried with no name. And there's nobody left to remember them. And there's nobody to visit their graves and think about them. And that's incredibly sad. In fact, I believe one of the first videos I did on my channel, if not the first video that was true crime related at least, it was about a Jane Doe case, and it was the Kelly Doe case from Caledonia, New York. And she actually was identified after many, many years due to the help of um, Carl Kobelman, who does reconstruction work with his computer on post-mortem pictures of unidentified victims and the Crime Stoppers webpage due to a bunch of web sleuths getting together and trying to figure out who this girl was and give her a name. They were successful in doing it, and she, she eventually was identified. So that kind of had a happy ending, but but this case so far, it doesn't really have that happy ending. And today we're talking about the case of the Walker County Jane Doe. It was Halloween night, 1980, in Huntsville, Texas, when a young girl arrived to town. She was dropped off at the South End Golf Station by a white male in either a 73 or 74 blue Chevy Caprice. It was about 6.30 in the evening, and as she walked away from the golf station headed north on Sam Houston Avenue, the small children of Huntsville were probably eating their dinner as fast as they could so that they could finish up, put on their costumes, and go out trick-or-treating. And maybe if she'd been in a different place and had lived a different life, this young girl would have been doing the same thing. Or maybe she would have been getting ready to go to a Halloween party with her friends. Maybe she would have been pouring bags of candy into a big orange bowl to hand out to trick-or-treaters while she made some popcorn and watched Friday the 13th. But on this Halloween night, the young girl walked away, alone, 
not knowing what she was walking into. The next morning, her body was found by a truck driver who had been driving by a Sam Houston National Forest. She was on the shoulder of Interstate 45, two miles away from Huntsville. Her body was completely naked, laying face down, and it was clear she'd suffered terribly at the hands of her attacker. She had sustained multiple bruises to her face and her body. She'd been savagely beaten and sexually assaulted with a blunt object. And there was a human bite mark on her shoulder. Found near the body were a pair of pantyhose, underwear, and a pair of leather red strappy sandals. Who was this girl and why had someone done this to her? An autopsy was done and it was determined that death had occurred six hours prior to her being discovered. She was a white female in her teens with hazel eyes and light brown hair to her shoulders. Her height was estimated to be between 5'6 and 5'10, her weight between 105 and 120 pounds, and she had pierced ears and a small scar on the end of her right eyebrow. Her toes had been painted pink and she wore a unique looking rectangular pendant with a smoky blue glass stone on a thin gold chain. Despite being sexually assaulted, the coroner found no traces of semen in or on this unidentified girl. And they determined that she had been beaten and abused before being strangled to death. Her teeth had been well taken care of, and due to the fact that she seemed to have access to good dental care, as well as the fact that she seemed to have been eating regularly, her toenails were freshly painted, and in general, she just had the overall appearance of a healthy kid, the police believed that she'd come from a middle-class background, and if she was a runaway, she hadn't been on the road for very long. It wasn't long before the media caught wind of this story and they began talking about it on the news and printing it in the papers. And because of this exposure, a few witnesses came forward and said that they believed they'd run into this girl or seen this girl the day before, which was Halloween night. A man who'd been at the South End Golf Station had seen her get dropped off. She had been wearing jeans, an oversized yellow pullover sweater with large pockets, and she'd been carrying a pair of strappy sandals in her hand. He said she looked disheveled as if she'd been traveling for a while and or sleeping in her clothes. She asked for directions to the Ellis Prison Unit and then set off on foot north on Sam Houston Avenue. That same night, a waitress working the evening shift at the Hitchin Post truck stop on I-45 also reported seeing a young girl matching the same description and wearing the same clothing. She'd come into the rest stop looking for directions to the Ellis prison unit. And she told the waitress that a friend of hers was an inmate there. The waitress noticed that this girl looked a little too young to be traveling on her own, so she asked the girl how old she was, and the girl responded that she was 19 and she was from Arkansas Pass, the Rockport area. When the waitress asked if her parents knew where she was, the girl responded with just two words, who cares? She had a map drawn for her of how to get to the Ellis prison unit, and then she left, and nobody reported seeing her after that. The police really didn't have any leads. No one had come forward to identify her, and because they didn't know who she was, they only had the information that they'd gotten from the eyewitnesses to go on. The fact that she was headed to the Ellis prison unit and that she was from the Rockport area of Texas. They showed every inmate and employee at Ellis a picture of her, but no one recognized her. They also showed her picture around the Rockport and Arkansas Pass area. Nobody recognized her. They talked to law enforcement in this area. They went to the high schools and compared her picture against pictures in the yearbook, but they didn't find her anywhere. No one knew her and it didn't appear as if she'd been enrolled in any of the schools in Rockport or Arkansas Pass. So really, the case went cold after that. She was buried on January 16, 1981 at the Oakwood Cemetery in Huntsville, and a tombstone donated by Morris Memorials was placed over her to mark the location of the body of a young girl who'd been brutally murdered and who it seemed no one missed. The stone said, unknown white female, died November 1st, 1980. Imagine that the culmination of your entire life boiled down to three words, unknown white female being buried by strangers, well-meaning strangers, but strangers all the same. And no one who even knows your name is present at your funeral to shed a tear or put it on your gravestone. And for 19 years, she stayed like that, unknown and evidently unmissed. Until 1999, when her remains were exhumed to extract DNA for testing. 
DNA profiling was originally developed as a method to establish paternity. It was first used in law enforcement in 1986 in England in the trial of a 17-year-old boy accused of two separate murders. The DNA results cleared the boy of these crimes, and the actual perpetrator was caught soon after with the help of DNA as well. The first conviction using DNA evidence happened in 1986 when the DNA in semen found at a crime scene was tested against the blood of a man named Tommy Lee Andrews. Two years later, West Virginia became the first state to rule in favor of using DNA evidence in court. So in 1980, DNA testing was in its infancy, and it really wasn't widely used or accepted in the justice system or in law enforcement. But in 1999, the efficacy of using it to find potential criminals or to identify unclaimed victims was gaining traction and popularity. The people of Huntsville were hoping that this technology could be used to help solve the mystery of who their Jane Doe was. And her DNA profile did give some information and narrowed her age down. They now decided that she was between 14 and 18 years old when before they'd kind of assumed she was either in her teens or her early 20s. Now we realize that she was much younger than initially thought. Now they knew she was a teenager and she could have been as young as 14 years old. And her genetic information was entered into the FBI's CODIS system. CODIS stands for Combined DNA Index System and it holds the genetic profiles of missing persons, convicted offenders, and forensic samples collected from crime scenes. Each state has different laws concerning CODIS and what they can enter into the system, and for privacy reasons, the database does not attach the DNA profile to a person's name. If there is a match, law enforcement has to take the proper measures to obtain a warrant for that information, and it's ruled upon by a judge to determine whether they have enough evidence to justify disclosing it. Much of the population is under a false set of beliefs when it comes to DNA and its role in helping solve crimes, especially with how commonplace DNA is in our everyday lives now. We see it on TV, you know, Law & Order is a good example of it, where they'll swab the suspect's mouth and they'll be like, we're gonna get your DNA and match it to the crime. And then two minutes later, they come back, like he's still in the room and they're like, ha ha, you're the guy. Well, it does not happen that quickly at all. Many people believe that when DNA is collected from a victim, it can be run through the system and within a couple of minutes, like the picture of who the person is just pops up on the screen and then you go home, job well done. But it's much more complicated, labor intensive and time consuming than that. Additionally, CODIS cannot be used for forensics genealogy since it only looks at 20 base pairs of the DNA strand and tracing genealogy requires over 600,000 base pairs, which is obviously much more. In 1999, there wasn't this huge rush to spit into a tube and send it off to 23andMe or Ancestry.com in order to find out where you came from or to discover lost relatives. So in 99, they'd extracted enough DNA from her to add her into the CODIS system, but not enough to do a full genetic profile. And at this point, there's not enough raw DNA of the Jane Doe in storage to do a full profile. So they'd have to exhume her body all over again. And once again, there there's red tape and hoops to jump through and things that you have to request and wait for before that can even happen. So what do we know about this girl? We know now about what age she was. We know what she looked like in life. We know that she liked to paint her toenails pink. We also know that she may have been heading to the Ellis prison unit and that she was from Texas. According to the police, she wasn't transient. If she had run away from home or from somewhere, she hadn't been out by herself for very long. She'd been well cared for, she'd been well groomed, she was healthy, so she'd been getting you know, regular hygiene, she'd been getting regular meals. She wasn't really a person or a runaway teen that had been living on the streets for a long time. But that's pretty much all that we know about her. We don't know what her favorite song was. We don't know if she preferred grape jelly to strawberry jelly. We don't know if she preferred crunchy peanut butter over creamy peanut butter. All the little things that make a person who they are, that make a person unique from everybody else, we don't know any of that stuff about her. So we're going to move on to the theories portion of this video. Where was she from? Who was she? Why was she traveling like this on her own? Who'd have dropped her off at the golf station? And why was she going to a men's prison unit? One of the most popular theories in this case is the serial killer theory. 
And it seems like whenever there's a murder like this where, you know, it's very violent and they're just kind of thrown on the side of the road and they're unidentified, the serial killer angle's always brought up. It's always connected somehow. A lot of it is the time period, I think. You know, in the 60s and the 70s and even going into the 80s, technology wasn't advanced as it is now and we didn't have the ability really to collect biological evidence and analyze it and connect it back to somebody. So serial killers in the 60s and the 70s they ran rampant pretty much because they knew the only way that they were going to get in trouble was if somebody literally caught them in the act, in the act of murdering somebody. So they took measures to not be seen, but they really weren't concerned with many other things. They kind of felt like it was the Wild West for serial killers and they were just going to do whatever they wanted and kill whoever they wanted. The Zodiac Killer, who has still not been identified today, confessed to killing five people in the late 60s. Most likely, the Zodiac was responsible for even more murders that he never fessed up to. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, confessed in 1978 to at least 33 murders. Ted Bundy was also active in the 70s, confessing to 36 murders, but it is believed that he's responsible for as many as 100. Then you had the son of Sam, now known as David Berkowitz, in New York during the summer of 1978. Since Berkowitz seemed to have a type of victim he gravitated to, which was young women with long, dark hair, terrified parents began keeping their daughters at home. And if they had to go out, they insisted that they either put their hair up or bleach it blonde. Some girls decided they would not even go out on a date until the killer was caught. Then you have guys like Otis Toole and Henry Lee Lucas. Toole and Lucas were both incredibly disturbed and dark men. And by chance, they happened to meet and found that they shared the same interests. Specifically, murdering people. They were known for picking up hitchhikers and brutalizing them, sexually abusing them, and then killing them. And between the two of them, they have confessed to hundreds of murders. Some of these confessions they took back, some they didn't. Some were found not to be connected with them at all. But still, they continue to take credit for multiple murders while they sat bored in prison. So Henry Lee Lucas has been speculated to be responsible for the death of Walker County Jane Doe. She had been found on the interstate, and Lucas told police that the interstate was where he liked to hunt for his victims. Police believed that she hadn't been killed at the location she was found. There were certain aspects of the condition of her body, reportedly that her underwear were stuffed into a certain part of her body, and the police believed that that was to prevent blood from dripping out of her as she was moved from one location to the next to avoid leaving a trail of blood. And there is no way to tie Henry Lee Lucas to the Walker County area, but he was a drifter. He did move around a lot. In 1971, he'd been convicted of attempting to kidnap three young girls, and he only served five years for this crime. After this, he moved around the country, leaving a trail of dead bodies behind him. In 1983, he was finally caught, but the years before that, he'd been very active. Another event that ties Henry Lee Lucas to this specific Jane Doe, Walker County Jane Doe, was the murder of another young girl, almost exactly a year to the day before Walker County Jane Doe was murdered. This other girl was also known as a Jane Doe for quite a while, and she was given the nickname Orange Socks because when her body was found, she was completely naked, and she only had on a pair of orange socks. Her murder was believed to have taken place on October 31st, 1979, and she was also found on the side of the road in Texas and she had been strangled to death, and her body was found only a few hours after she had died. Now, Henry Lee Lucas confessed to this murder, and although he confessed to a lot of murders, obviously it still had to be taken seriously and looked into. And there was strong evidence that Lucas wasn't even in Texas when Orange Socks was killed. He'd been in Florida, where his buddy Otis Toole lived. Henry Lee Lucas claimed that he had picked up Orange Socks in Oklahoma, they'd had sex and then they were driving for a little while and he, he basically wanted to have sex with her again and she told him, not right now, and he got pissed, right? He was pissed because he's a crazy psychotic serial killer who thinks that the world revolves around him. So he got even more angry when she tried to get out of the car and run away and according to him, he then killed her and did a lot of other unsavory things to her body before just throwing her away like garbage. He said after he killed her, he drove her body to Georgetown, Texas, where it was found. He also said that he believed she'd told him her name was Joan or Joni, but he killed so many women, he just couldn't be expected to remember all of their names. 
His confession contradicted itself several times and it was later discovered that he'd been shown pictures of the crime scene before being interviewed by the police. And for him to be able to drive from Florida, where eyewitnesses say he was working at that time, to Oklahoma, to Texas, and then back to Florida, that would have taken quite a long time. He would have had to have driven 70 miles an hour non-stop. Many do find this unlikely. I think it could be possible, especially considering the fact that Lucas was a man who liked to stay on the move. He liked to drive around. He liked to kind of go to all different cities and different towns to commit his murders. So if he had the weekend off from work and he was itching for a kill, it doesn't surprise me that he would have jumped in his car and started driving. But it's still not the strongest theory, especially since Henry Lee Lucas recanted this confession after giving it. This Jane Doe, known as Orange Sox, was later identified and given her name back. It was Deborah Jackson, and she was 23 from Abilene, Texas. She had run away from home two years before her death, and her family hadn't reported her missing at the time. So she had never been in any missing persons database. Later, Deborah's sister saw a sketch of orange sacks and told the police that this was her sister, and a DNA test confirmed it. It's still unknown who killed Deborah Jackson, but at least her family know what happened to her, and she has a gravestone with her name on it. And there were a lot of similarities between the two cases. Both girls had been found naked on the side of the road. Both girls had been strangled to death and their bodies had been found on the same day, a year apart. Additionally, although they had been clothed at one point, none of their clothes were found at the crime scene. But there are some differences as well. Where Deborah was a clear runaway, and the police could tell because her fingernails and her toenails needed a good clipping, and it was pretty clear she hadn't bathed or eaten well in a while. Walker County Jane Doe was well taken care of pink polished toenails, jewelry, well-fed, well-bathed, good dental care. However, for a killer who may have been looking specifically for runaway girls, the two girls may have just looked the same to him or her. I mean, I'm sure if a serial killer is specifically preying on runaway girls, he's not going to ask to see their toenails first before determining whether or not they truly are runaways. And although we now know who Orange Sax was, it doesn't solve the mystery of who killed her. And the same person could have killed Orange Sax and Walker County Jane Doe. There were a lot of similarities, especially the fact that it was exactly a year apart, but it still doesn't bring us any closer to knowing who that person was. I don't think that it was Henry Lee Lucas. Another serial killer, Sam Little, has also been looked at as a potential suspect. He was convicted of killing three women in California between 1987 and 1989, and one woman in Texas in 1994. He also claimed to have killed over 93 people, and law enforcement officials have positively linked him to over 60 of these. The FBI have also confirmed his involvement in 50 of these which makes Samuel Little the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. I'm not sure how he's related to this case, considering this was not one of the murders he confessed to, but there is proof due to traffic tickets and violations that he was in the area at times, but nothing to prove he was there at this exact time. He did use strangulation to kill his victims, and they were usually young women, so the MO is there, but not any proof to place him in the area at that time. Many also speculate it could have been some other serial killer operating in this area at that time. So many murders and disappearances went unsolved during this period. There could have been another drifting serial killer, much like Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole, going from city to city, picking out victims, and then leaving before the body was even even discovered. The fact that she was on an interstate and that she'd been at a truck stop and that it was a trucker who discovered her body the next day also raises the possibility that this could have been a trucker, someone who was in town for a very short time and gone before the sun rose the next day. She'd been at that truck stop right before when she asked for directions to Ellis Prison Unit. What if a trucker who'd been in the truck stop listened to her talking to the waitress, heard her say that she was 19, heard her say that she didn't care if her parents knew where she was and realized that this girl was alone and this was a perfect opportunity to pounce on her. Due to the fact that he knew where she was headed, he wouldn't even have to leave right after her to cut her off at the pass. So if he didn't want to seem suspicious and just grab his keys as soon as this girl walked out, he could basically just wait 10, 15 minutes, finish his coffee, pay his check, and then head out in the direction going towards Ellis Prison and he'd see her walking on the side of the road on Interstate 45. 
There was another possible break in this case. In December of 2015, a family came forward and said that they'd met a young girl who matched the description of Walker County Jane Doe in the 80s while they were staying at a Texas motel. She said that her name was Kathleen, or Kathy, that she was 16 from Corpus Christi, Texas, and that she was headed to see a friend in prison. Now, the initial sketch of Walker County Jane Doe, it's not great. I mean, I'm sure at that time, given the technology they had, that they were just using a pencil and paper, it was, it was a good one and it was the best they could do, but it, it wasn't great. A man named Carl Kopelman began taking an interest in using the post-mortem pictures of unidentified people and enhancing them using a computer program. As we already talked about, his work was responsible for giving a name to Kelly Doe. His rendition of what Walker County Jane Doe might have looked like in life gives us a much better idea of her features and physical appearance. Now the family had seen this picture and they produced a picture that they had taken of this young girl they met in the motel in the 80s. The similarity is striking and it leads me to believe that Kathy from the motel and the Jane Doe found in Walker County are the same girl. But this doesn't solve anything for us. It only adds more mystery to the case. The girl in the motel could have been lying about her name, where she was from. In fact, Jane Doe may have been lying to everyone she talked to. But if this was a girl who was running away from someone or something, and she'd given a fake age so that no one called the police about a minor running away from home, what was to stop her from giving false information about her name, where she was from, and even where she was going? because from what we can tell, no one at Ellis knew her or was expecting her. Was it possible she was using the prison as a landmark in order to visit someone that she knew lived close by to the Ellis prison unit? This was before the internet era, before match.com and swipe right and swipe left, before chat rooms, before older creepy men who were predators sat on the internet trying to lure young children into visiting them. So we know she didn't talk to or meet someone online. If she'd been talking to somebody from Huntsville or that area, it would have had to have been via letter or over the telephone. They may have given her the address in a letter or over the phone and explained that it was near Ellis Prison Unit. Maybe she'd lost the slip of paper she'd written the address on. Maybe she'd lost the letter it was written on or maybe she just hadn't written it down at all and she couldn't remember exactly what the address was. So she asked people where Ellis Prison was, hoping she could get in the general vicinity and then figure it out once she got there. Police never found any letters or correspondence on her. In fact, they never even found that map that was drawn for her at the truck stop. Like I said, the only pieces of her clothing found with her were her sandals, pantyhose, and underwear. And who knows if she was even wearing these pantyhose? I doubt that she was because she was wearing jeans and a big, you know, sweater. And why would you wear pantyhose under jeans, especially if you're a runaway teenager? But we don't know where those pantyhose came from. But her sweatshirt and her jeans, those were not found at the scene. So either she was actually killed someplace else and the person who murdered her kept her clothes with them. And if she had letters or the map or correspondence of any kind, they were just probably in the pockets and the person didn't even realize what they were keeping with them. Or the clothes were taken purposely because she had correspondence or a map to the prison. And whoever it was, that she was meeting or whoever it was that had killed her didn't want the police to be able to trace whatever correspondence or letters or maps she had with her to them. The most likely scenario for me is that they kept her clothes because they didn't want any potential biological evidence being picked up by the police and they just didn't realize what she had in the pockets of her clothes, which could have been a letter from the person she was meeting and probably the map to Ellis Prison Unit. Ellis Prison is 12 miles north of Huntsville and it would have been quite a walk. And if she had left the truck stop and headed north, the route she appeared to be taking was kind of a roundabout if her ultimate destination was the prison. Ellis held only male prisoners and in 1980, it was the location of the state of Texas men's death row. It had been the brainchild of former prison director of Texas, George Beto, and he had designed it to be the strictest prison in the system. And Ellis has had its share of controversy. 
Six months after Walker County Jane Doe was found, an inmate named E. Roy Brown, who had been convicted of armed robbery and burglary, drowned the warden and fatally shot the unit's farm manager, Billy Moore. When he went on trial, he claimed that the two men had been trying to kill him because he planned on exposing a prison theft scheme. 35 out of 36 jurors found that he had been justified and was acquitted by reasons of self-defense, which means there must have been some solid proof that the warden and the farm manager were trying to kill Brown. In 1984, Texas signed a civil rights agreement that stated Eroy Brown would never serve time in another Texas prison, and he was moved to a federal prison in South Carolina. This was done allegedly for his safety. Is that because he had a story to tell about the Texas prison system? Or is it because he killed two prison officials, whether it was self-defense or not? We'll probably never know. And I'm not saying that a prison that has a few corrupt individuals means that every prison worker there is corrupt or that the whole place is corrupt. But come with me down the speculation path again, just for a moment, and wonder what if with me for a second and see if it triggers anything or gets any juices going. Let's say there was more than just a few corrupt individuals in the prison. I mean, if we're to believe E. Roy Brown's story and 35 jurors did, the warden himself, the highest ranking member in the prison, he was in on this scheme, allegedly. So what if Walker County Jane Doe had been communicating with someone in this prison? What if one of the prison staff was working with this prisoner that Jane Doe was communicating with in order to carry out crimes? This was where death row in Texas was at that time, so some of the worst of the worst criminals were housed here. And maybe she was a girl who was into that kind of stuff, like the women who wrote Ted Bundy letters and the women who still today write Chris Watts letters. What if this prisoner lured her to Ellis for a visit, but his partner in crime, allegedly an employee at the prison, cut her off at the pass? murdered her, left her on the side of the road, and then went back to the prison to relive and share this experience with the prisoner who had lured her there. When the police come to Ellis to show the picture of this girl around, of course, neither the prisoner nor the prison guard are going to admit that they know her or killed her. I know it's crazy, I know it's out there, but we just can't assume because somebody works as a prison guard at a prison that they're good and upstanding citizens. There's a few maximum security prisons uh, close by to where I live, and I've met a few of the security guards who work there, and I can tell you for sure, not all of them are, are right in the heads. Not all of them are. And this could be from a complete immersion in like the underbelly of the world. You know, you spend all your days with these criminals who killed people and committed heinous crimes and maybe it starts to get to you or maybe you got a job as a prison guard specifically because you were interested in the darkness of the world and you wanted to spend your days with these people. Maybe this person got a job at the prison for the thrill of dominating someone, for the power trip of being in control of so many people and a lot of prison guards do enjoy that thrill of having that power over somebody else and a personality like that a personality that seeks out jobs where they get to be in charge of so many people and they can basically do whatever they want and nobody's going to listen because who cares about these guys? They're murderers and rapists and terrible people. I can do whatever I want and nothing's ever going to happen to me. That kind of personality is problematic and it does lead to other activities or it can if, if left unchecked. What does the prisoner get out of this, you ask? Well, he gets to live vicariously through the prison guard who comes back to the prison and tells him about everything that happened, maybe even brings back something of the victims for the prisoner to keep. You know, the prisoner, if he's a murderer, he's, he's in jail for life. That thrill for him, because it is a thrill for serial killers and people who murder, you know, in a pattern, it's a thrill for them. They enjoy it. They like the feeling. They're addicted to that feeling. So this prisoner may do whatever just to be a part of a murder. And like I said, I know it's crazy and it's out there and it literally sounds like the plot to some movie, but the speculation path has never led us wrong before. I also took to the internet to see what everybody else thinks about this case, and I found an interesting post on the blog spot of a person called Nightwind777. 
The writer claims that she or he, I don't know who Nightwind 777 is, if it's a male or a female or whatever, but he or she got a tip from a woman who used to live at this place called Rebecca House. Rebecca House was a girl's home located in Corpus Christi, Texas, which is where the motel girl said she was from. So you know I had to do some more research into Rebecca House or Rebecca Home, whatever. I had to do more research into her. It was established in 1968 by a man named Lester Roloff, a prominent leader in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The purpose of this place was allegedly to help young girls who were addicted to drugs, banished from their homes, involved in prostitution, serving time in jail, or who were just in need of refuge. Now, the year before, Lester Roloff had established an independent Baptist church in Corpus Christi that he called People's Baptist Church. I'm getting Jim Jones vibes, don't know about you. Roloff was not a fan of gluttony, psychology, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, television, or communism. And he often spoke out passionately against these devices of the devil in his sermons. He had a private plane that he would travel around in so that he could bring his message on the road and going on the radio to talk about all the good work he was doing with these girls asking for listeners to send donations. He said that the Rebecca Home for Girls took in girls from the jailhouse, broken homes, hippie droves, and dope dives. Girls who were walking through the wilderness of sin. He transformed them into scripture-quoting, gospel-singing believers. But since then, many have come forward painting a very different picture of what it was like to live in one of Lester Roloff's rehab homes. They were locked for days in isolation rooms where Roloff's sermons played on a loop that never stopped. In a 1973 court hearing, when Roloff was being prosecuted by the state of Texas on behalf of 16 Rebecca girls, he was asked why he used corporal punishment on the young women in his care, and he was quoted as saying, better a pink bottom than a black soul. The girls were not allowed to talk about worldly things such as television. They couldn't sing unless they were singing gospel songs. If they were caught speaking about anything besides God and the Bible, they would be punished. They could not look at boys in church, and they had to maintain a distance from the other girls of at least six inches. If you were new there, you could not make eye contact with another new girl for at least 60 days. Initially, they had not been allowed to close their doors before bedtime, but eventually the doors were just removed off the bedrooms, giving the girls absolutely no privacy. And there were a multitude of other sins that they could commit that they would be punished for, such as falling asleep in the middle of the day or not finishing their food. There was no television, no books besides approved religious readings. Any letters that the girls wrote were read and approved before they were sent out. Phone calls were allowed, but only to immediate family members, and they were always monitored. If the girl said anything negative about the home, the call would be immediately disconnected. There were intercoms installed in each bedroom, allowing the staff to monitor every word that was said amongst the girls. Like I said, this reminds me so much of Jim Jones and the People's Temple. This reminds me so much of that church we talked about in a recent coffee and crime time where they were taking homeless people off the streets and basically trapping them in these homes and taking their social security benefits and SNAP benefits. And if you've ever seen the Netflix series, The Family, there's a lot of striking similarities there as well, such as not being able to talk about worldly things. That was something that these kids who were in these homes and the family, they weren't allowed to talk about, you know, things in the outside world. All they could talk about was the Bible. But what does this have to do with Walker County Jane Doe? Well, the woman who reached out to Nightwind 777 claimed that she'd been at Rebecca House in, you know, the years before 1980 and that there was another girl that stayed there as well who looked very much like Walker County Jane Doe. Now, the identity of the person with this tip has not been disclosed, but it has been verified that she was an alumni of Rebecca House, and she also claims to have had a father in the prison unit at Ellis at that time. So she said that herself and this other girl had quite a bit in common. Now, that part of the story always kind of stopped me, and I was like, wait, you have a father or had a father who was housed at Ellis Prison Unit, and you said that made you have a lot in common with this other girl, but did she have a father that was locked up in prison? Because that was never clarified to me, or, you know, did you just know later that she was trying to get to Ellis Prison, so you assumed, did she ever say anything to you about Ellis Prison? These are the questions I have 
that, that are not answered yet. But either way, this girl was an actual resident at Rebecca House, and Rebecca House would have been the kind of place you'd send your daughter when she was acting rebellious and needed to be set on the right and righteous path. And it seemed that some of the families that attended Roloff's church also sent their daughters there just for an education. Maybe Walker County Jane Doe was one of these girls. And that was why she'd seemed to be well taken care of, but also seemed to be kind of angry with her parents. Cause if my parents sent me to a place like that, I would be pissed. Maybe she'd escaped from the home and she was so paranoid about being tracked down that she just lied to everyone about everything so that nobody would be able to find her if they were following her. Maybe once it was discovered that she was missing, the people who ran the home told her parents, you know, this is God's will. It's better off this way. She ran away. Let her find her path. Don't report her missing. Don't tell anybody about this. Just let go and let God. Because, you know, the people who are running the home, it would kind of look bad if a girl ran away. And if she did get found by the police and the police brought her back and they were like, hey, why'd you run away? She may have started talking about how horrible it was living at that house. So they really didn't want her found. And Lester Roloff has been described as somebody who is extremely charismatic, extremely convincing, um, you know, kind of like a Jim Jones type. So if Roloff himself had spoken to her parents and was like, your daughter has gone on her own path and she's searching for God in her own way and you need to let her do that, the parents may have been like, well, Lester Roloff says it's cool, so it's cool. We're not going to make a fuss. She's going to find her path. She'll come back. Maybe Walker County Jane Doe was such a rebellious teenager that her parents were just happy to have her out of their hair. And it sounds terrible, but there are parents like this. Don't deny it. The tip also stated that another girl who had been an alumni at Rebecca House recognized this Jane Doe girl as well and said that her name was Kathy. There are some pictures of this girl that's believed to be Kathy in a documentary from the late 70s named Freedom's Last Call, created by Lester Roloff, of course. A girl singing in the Rebecca House Choir does bear a striking resemblance, and this girl is seen again from more video footage of the girls listening to Roloff giving a sermon. But is it possible that this girl could have been the same Kathy seen by the family in the motel? who said she was from Corpus Christi, told him that her name was Kathy or Kathleen, and if that's the case, she could also be the same girl who was found on November 1st on the side of the road in Huntsville. Maybe she'd been staying at Rebecca House after she got kicked out of her home by her parents, and that's why no one ever reported her missing. Her parents had removed her from the house, and the girl's home wasn't worried about where she'd gone off to. This is a very popular theory online. I don't necessarily believe this one or feel that there's enough support for it. People suggest that she may have been in foster care uh, because of the fact that she was well taken care of, but she still seemed angry with her parents. So the fact that she seemed angry with her parents would say to me, her parents hadn't died, and that's why she was in foster care. Her parents may have been bad parents, abusive, alcoholics, drug addicts, whatever, and that's why she'd been removed from their care and placed in foster care and that would mean she would probably be pretty angry with them. But like I said the foster system theory is a little bit less likely to me because as damaged as the CPS system is I find it hard to believe that a girl could just like disappear from the foster home and the social worker assigned to her case wouldn't ever realize that she just disappeared from the foster home and run away unless now here we go, down the speculation path again, unless the foster parents didn't report that she'd run away and maybe the social worker who has a big workload, you know, is doing a lot, has a lot of cases and a lot of homes to visit, kind of felt like this girl was doing okay, so she put their home at the, the bottom of her priority list and when she finally did get around to going there, it was like a month or two months later and the foster family was like, yeah, she ran away like two months ago. And the social worker thought, oh, well, crap. At this point, I have to go to my superiors and tell them that this girl ran away two months ago, but they're gonna ask me, why haven't you been going to the house every week and visiting with this girl and making sure she's being taken care of and doing your job? So the social worker may have kept quiet in order to prevent getting in trouble or losing her job. And that may be what happened, but that's a stretch. Like that's, that's really far down the speculation path. We're going far. And lastly, we have the satanic ritual theory because you know, Halloween. Because it's Halloween night and everything that happens on Halloween night has to be connected to Satan. Why did Halloween get such a bad rap? I mean, I know, I know. According to Anton LaVey in his satanic Bible, 
he said that Halloween was a really important religion to Satanists. I get it, but it's also fun for the rest of us. And I say this with full knowledge that I found no satanic connections to Walker County Jane Doe's murder. There wasn't even a full moon that night, but I do admit I am no expert on Satanism, so I could be wrong. The 80s were a popular time for Satanists to be, you know, created and beginning their journey on that religion. Anton LaVey's A Satanic Bible was published in 1969, and that was only three years after LaVey had formally created the Church of Satan. So, I mean, yeah, you could have had some Satanists running around at that time, and yeah, I mean, but since there's no actual evidence, there's no, like, marks or ritualistic candles, but like I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. I just know what I've seen on TV. I don't know what actual Satanists do. To me, I just see, like, you know, a pentagram and then candles all over it, and then maybe some, like, blood mixed with the dust of your enemies and then you make like marks on your forehead. I don't know what Satanists actually do, but as far as I could tell, it seemed just like a horrible, horrible person who murdered an innocent girl. It didn't seem like there was any darker elements that weren't already dark enough being that somebody got murdered. I do feel like it's strange though that her necklace was never identified. Like nobody ever came forward and said, oh, I have a necklace similar to that or I've seen a necklace like that at this store or this person makes it. It was a very distinctive, odd-looking necklace, and nobody's ever really come forward and said that they've matched it to anywhere else. So I do always wonder where she got that necklace from. I'm going to do more research into that necklace and, like, do a Google reverse search, although I'm sure that people online have already done that because the internet sleuths are, you know, very um, obsessed with this case and look into it a lot. So I'm sure somebody's already done that, but I'm going to do it just for kicks. So as I said, this case was obviously incredibly sad. This girl was clearly already feeling disappointed by somebody. And we know that because even if she was being sassy when saying who cares about her parents, she clearly felt displaced at that point. She clearly felt that her parents didn't care about her or weren't being good parents to her, even if it wasn't true. So she died at the hands of an incredibly violent person who made sure to torture her and give her a lot of pain and anguish before he or she took her life. And now she's buried under a borrowed gravestone without her name or her birth date or anything on it that actually signifies who she was and what part she played in this world. And there's so many more like her in the world. So because of that, I would like to start doing a Jane or John Doe case at least once a month to bring awareness because these people are not identified and the more we get their pictures out and the more we push their stories, one of you might see somebody that you recognize or one of you might see somebody that kind of looks like your uncle or your second uncle on your mom's side and you might ask him if he knew anybody that looked like that picture. You know what I mean? Like we spread awareness, we spread the story, we get the word out. So what do you guys think about doing a Jane or John Doe case every month? I know some of those cases can have very little information, which makes it kind of difficult to make a longer, well-researched video about the case itself. But I mean, I think I'm pretty, pretty capable of fleshing out the case and the story and the time and the place and painting a really good three-dimensional picture for you guys. So even if the videos aren't 90 minutes, they'll still be long enough and they'll still be interesting enough, hopefully, to keep your attention and help raise awareness for these people and their cases and their lives. But on that note, thank you so much for being here with me today. Halloween has been fun, but I am exhausted. I, I've never researched so much in my life. Even when I was going to school for psychology and I was writing like five papers a week, I've never done so much research and so much writing and it's it's so much fun it's stimulating it's everything that i've ever wanted to do but mentally it's exhausting so i'm gonna need a good three-day nap when halloween is over which who knows when that's gonna happen <laughs> check out magellan tv in the description box if you're interested thank you so much for being here stay kind stay beautiful and stay spooky bye <laughs>